Uh, thank you for joining us tonight for our River Watch Winter Speaker Series. For those of you who are not familiar with Illinois River Watch Network, we are a community science organization that trains volunteers to monitor water quality in their own communities. The mission of Riverwatch is to safeguard the future of Illinois rivers and streams through stewardship, education, and sound science. Before we get started, I ask that you keep your microphone muted during the presentation to limit the distractions. We will have a Q&A session after the presentation, so if you have a question along the way, you can either put it into the chat box um, and Amy will answer it at the end of the talk, or you can save the question and ask it aloud. And with that, I'd like to welcome Amy Janik. Amy received her undergraduate degree from University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she majored in conservation biology and Spanish. Amy worked um, as an avian research assistant, environmental educator, and conservation crew leader before returning to school and completing her master's degree at Western Michigan University. Amy is currently a research specialist at National Great Rivers Research and Education Center, where she is the lead on the Dragonflies and Damselflies of Illinois project. And tonight, Amy will be presenting on this ongoing project. And with that, I'd like to welcome Amy Janik. All right, awesome. Thank you, Hannah. Um, and um, like she said, I'm going to be um, telling you about this project that we've been working on here at um, the National Great Rivers Research and Education Center. Um, I'm working on this project with um, Dr. Danielle Hake and Dr. Um, John Crawford from NGRAC, and then also Dr. Ethan Kessler from the Illinois Natural History Survey. And so just a little background of kind of what's going to happen today, tonight, um, is I'm going to be focusing on the life history and an in-depth background of odonates, um, which I'll explain more what those are, um, and focusing on their behavior, their ecology, um, and just a lot of really cool, interesting information about them. I'm also going to be talking about their conservation needs and any threats that they face. I'm going to be describing our project that we're gearing up for to start in um, April, uh, talk about our goals and our methods for this project, and then our future plans that we also have scheduled. So to start off, what are odonates? Well, the order, the order of odonata is made up of two suborders. We have Anisoptera, which are the dragonflies, and we have the Zygoptera, which are damselflies. You'll he hear me refer to them as odonates throughout the presentation. Um, the adults are easily recognizable, as I'm sure you all know. We have dragonflies that are fairly robust, and they perch with their wings open. And then we also have damselflies, which are slender, and most of their species perch with their wings closed. So dragonflies and damselflies can be characterized by their rather large eyes, their tiny antenna, they have chewing mouth parts, and well-developed wing muscles. They are carnivorous at all stages of their life cycle, and they have been, there have been over 6,000 species described in the world. They occur on every continent except for Antarctica, and they can be found, found in a variety of freshwater habitats that range from ephemeral streams to large lakes. And so odonates have first appear in the fossil record about 250 million years ago. And although some of the groups and suborders have long gone extinct, there are many families that we recognize today that were present at the start of the Jurassic period. They appear before the dinosaurs and long outlast them. And so the odonate life cycle spans across the aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems where they play key roles in both of these environments. Unlike butterflies, odonates have an incomplete metamorphosis, so that means that they lack a pupa or a chrysalis stage um, between that larva and that adult stage. Odonate nymphs actually stay active in the water while they're developing and then molts from their larval skin. A lot of the times that's called an exoskeleton. You can see it a lot in cicadas. And so I'm going to go through a few of the stages of the life cycles, and I want to start with the egg stage. And so there are a variety of ways that female odonates can oviposit or lay eggs. Some species will directly put them into the water, some will drop them from the air into the water, and other species will lay them um, into or onto actually aquatic plants. Um, adult females can actually lay a clutch of eggs a day. Uh, the number of eggs can range from 100 to 1,000 to 1, eggs, depending on that species. 
the developing eggs can either hatch in a matter of five days or 250 days. It's all based on what species they are and what environmental conditions the ecosystem um, that they inhabit are going on. So lots of variation just within the egg stage. And so next we have the nymph or the larva stage. And I'm gonna guess that a lot of us are not very familiar with odonates at this stage. They kind of look like aliens. Um, and odonates actually will spend most of their life underwater in this stage. The variation in development time is quite extreme. In warmer temperatures, species can complete their larval development in a month, um, but in colder high latitude streams, larvae can take up to eight years to fully develop. And so before moving on to the next life cycle stage, kind of wanted to give a background on the basic insect body plan. Um, I hope to kind of describe some really neat morphological characteristics. And so I want you to know where these are located on the body. And so first, nymphs and adults both have a typical three-part body plan, which is made up of the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. So one of the more fascinating aspects of an odonate nymph head is their labium, or essentially the lower lip of the mouth part. Depending on the species, the labium can be flat or it can be scoop shaped more like a spoon. And this is one of the key characteristics that we use to identify the family that a nymph belongs to. And the labium allows for rapid strike when hunting for prey basically acting like a catapult with stored kinetic energy energy to startle and capture a prey. They have needle-like projections at the end of these labium um, called the movable hook, and these are used to hold or stab at prey. And so these are some examples um, of some mouth parts that we have that we're currently trying to ID um, in our lab right now. And using like a digital microscope, I was able to take some pictures. Um, and I wanted to kind of get an in-close view of what these actually look like because they're pretty weird looking. Um, and you can see that the length and the shape of these, you have a dragonfly on the left and a damselfly on the right, um, are very different. And so we can use these characteristics of their mouths to basically figure out which family that an individual might belong to. Um, and you can also look closer at the setae, which are like a, it's basically a structure that resembles a hair or a bristle. And then also the movable hook, those are also used to identify what family um, these species, or these individuals belong to. And so the most obvious part of the odonate adult head is a pair of large prominent eyes. Um, so for dragonflies, the eyes are close together and they touch, um, whereas for damselflies, they are spread apart and wide. Uh, vision is the primary sense used by odonates, and in most cases, um, it has the compound, compound eyes are made up of 30,000 simple eyes, and each of these eyes function independently of one another. And it's kind of one of the main reasons uh, that odonate adults are so hard to catch in the field is due to their ability to rotate their head 170 degrees from their normal position. They can also tilt it 90 degrees upwards, which means they lack a lot of blind spots, which make it very difficult for them to catch. And so next we have the thorax. Um, and so in both the adults and the nymphs, the thorax serves essentially the same purpose. The thorax is where the legs, so three sets of legs are located along with the wings or wing pads if they're nymphs are located. And so the wings of adults are constructed with a very complex set of veins um, that support an incredibly thin membrane. Uh, they're made of a flexible protein that allows the wings to bend and move and easily recover. The four wings operate independently of one another, allowing for optimal flight performance and increased agility. Um, interestingly, the, the average flight speed of a medium-sized dragonfly is about 4.5 miles per hour. And some skimmer dragonflies can actually reach up to 9 miles per hour during a territorial defense. So the next part, we below the thorax, we have the abdomen, which is kind of the main part of a lot of these insects. Um, and so the dragonfly nymph abdomens can range from stout and robust 
Uh, they kind of look like discs a little bit, or they can be a little bit more elongate and cylindrical. But then we also have the damselflies that are slender and narrow, similar to how their bodies look when they're adults. Um, but they do have prominent gills that resemble kind of like leaf-like appendages at the end of their abdomen. And that's a very useful distinguishing characteristic of them. So one of the really cool parts of the nymph abdomen um, is that their gills are actually located um, in that abdomen. Uh, so that's how they breathe. And so for damselflies, um, those are those leaf-like appendages. That's what they breathe through. Those are their gills. They can also be used for swimming, but they're mostly for breathing. Um, and then for dragonflies, their rectum contains their respiratory system. So they basically breathe through their butt. Um, but because of this strong diaphragm that they have in their abdomen, water can be expelled very rapidly, um, specifically from their rectum, which will shoot them um, uh, like basically shoot them um, and jet propulsion. And this allows them to escape from predators, which is a pretty neat thing. The only species that, um, or an only organism that can utilize jet propulsion. And so while some nymphs may live underwater for a few years, uh, the lifespan of an adult odonate is actually much shorter. Um, adult dragonflies and damselflies can live between one month or a few months, um, and during which they spend most of their time feeding, basking, or reproducing. The diet of odonate nymphs, like I had said, um, they're all carnivorous in every life stage. And so they usually vary from large aquatic organisms to small aquatic in, uh, insects. And so some larger, more developed dragonflies can forage on fish or tadpoles, whereas smaller uh, dragonfly nymphs, damselflies, can eat things like mosquito, um, larva, and mayfly nymphs. They are really successful predators due to their ability to camouflage within the detritus of the water. Um, and they can swim quickly through vegetation while they're hunting as well. So as well, they are uh, adults uh, are also have a wide range of prey. Um, they eat a majority of tiny insects um, to make up their diet. However, a lot of um, dragonflies and damselflies, butterflies, and even hummingbirds can become prey for some of the largest dragonfly species. Uh, they are incredibly impressive and successful predators. So odonates have a couple of different ways to stay away from predators. Uh, some females, uh, odonates are cryptic, and so they're able to blend in with their surroundings. Um, but also they use their speed and agility. Uh, odonates, uh, odonates use like a zigzag flying pattern. Um, they use this to outsmart their predators while being chased, similar to zebras and things like that. Um, however, there are some unlucky ones that usually will become prey to predators such as birds, bats, frogs, and lizards. So odonates are a really colorful group of insects. They represent all the colors of the rainbow. And these vibrant colors are not just an aesthetic. Uh, they serve for specific purposes. Uh, males are commonly the more colorful one to make it easier to identify them. Uh, if sometimes they would get confused with females if they look too similar. So this makes it a little bit easier when selecting mates. Um, odonates also live in really sunny wetlands. Um, and a lot of the times those odonates will have a brighter color and those are able to reflect the solar rays in order to regulate their temperatures. And certain colors are handy to camouflage that help dragonflies blend into their surroundings and stay safe, but they can also be used to attract mates or to warn off um, would-be predators. So mating for dragonflies and damselflies usually takes place near water, uh, where male odonates will set up territories. Um, and they set up these territories to try and prevent too many males from occupying the area and causing more competition for females. Um, although courtship varies among odonate families, there are many damselfly families that uh, have courtship displays that can be elaborate and flashy, similar to courtship displays in birds. And so when dragonflies and damselflies mate, uh, the pairs form a wheel position, which is unique among insects. 
can sometimes look like a heart, which is kind of cool. Uh, quickly after mating, females will oviposit uh, into uh, water either by themselves or sometimes still in tandem with a male. And so adults have specific flight seasons, which is a period when they are on the wing. The timing of a flight season is mostly based on larval development and environmental conditions. So some species will have a synchronized emergence, but then also a synchronized die off. Uh, other species will emerge and have a flight season that will last throughout the spring, summer, and fall. Um, there are many odonate nymphs specifically that will hibernate in the water over the winter and then emerge as an adult early in the spring. Um, however, it's very rare for there to be any adult odonates that hibernate over the winter. And so dragonflies can disperse and migrate long distances due to their strong and powerful flight. Uh, damselflies are also uh, can disperse, but they use um, prevailing winds rather than their strong muscles. Um, species that their nymphs develop in ephemeral wetlands or wetlands that are only temporary can fly far distances to find a new wetland. So this is very useful for those species in particular. So we actually, one of the best known migrant dragonflies in North America is the common green darner. Um, one of the bigger dragonflies we have in the States. Um, and so in one study, the researchers um, attached tiny radio transmitters to the thorax of an adult common green darner um, in order to track their movements during their fall migration on the East Coast. They found that they migrated about every three days during which during the daytime when the winds were um, not too high. Um, and they were able to travel about 36 miles in six days, which is pretty impressive for um, an insect of that size. So since odonates kind of span both aquatic and terrestrial habitats, they are vulnerable to threats that impact freshwater ecosystems, but also landscapes. And so some of the challenges that dragonflies and damselflies face are habitat loss, pollution, and climate change. Wetlands serve as one of the world's most economically valuable ecosystems, and they're disappearing rapidly. Uh, climate change, which is already a threat to many insect species, uh, will lead to more extreme droughts, and this will directly impact um, odonates and decimate their populations without having fresh water to reproduce and to feed, um, basically complete all of their life cycles. And so some species are generous, which means that they can kind of eat or inhabit various areas. They're very flexible, um, which would allow them to potentially adapt to a more urban environment. And we have seen this occur in a few species. However, there are others that are more specialist and they focus on eating a specific type of prey or they need a specific plant to lay eggs, things like that. Um, and those species won't thrive in all these urban environments. And so even odonates, um, ones that can adapt to an urban habitat can still be sensitive to water quality. Um, and various pollutants such as road salt, heavy metals and insecticides can be detrimental as well to these populations. So this kind of brings me, you know, tying it all together and due to the many environmental threats that odonates um, face and their key functions that they play in ecosystems and their roles are very important. Um, it's crucial to assess the status of odonates in Illinois. Uh, conservation of invertebrates or insects is often neglected and many species um, are in, uh, many species in need are never recognized due to a lack of information or any baseline data. And Illinois lacks data on the distribution's rarity and vulnerability of numerous families of odonates, and it's hard to know how to protect them uh, without this knowledge. So this heat map that I have pulled up of Illinois uh, is a collection of all the odonate records that have been kept through um, a community scientist database, so odonate, Odonata Central. And the reddish and orange areas kind of show the spots that have been um, have recorded about over 30 records of a species or and all of that purple is less than 30 and then any of the no color means that there's no data. And so we can see that the Chicagoland area is 
probably the only main part of the state where there's consistent records um, and this consistent knowledge of odonates. And so one of the, the big goals, the biggest goal of our project here at Edngrac is to um, fill in these knowledge gaps and these, these gaps of areas throughout the state of Illinois um, to find out what species of odonates are occupying the streams and ponds in other areas of Illinois. So to fill in these gaps, uh, we have a few ways to do this. Um, and so we've basically been assembling and analyzing data from insect collections um, in Illinois Natural History Museums. Um, so field museum and other local university museums have contributed their data. Um, so by doing this, we are able to assess what species of odonates are underrepresented. Um, it will basically show a point um, or a specimen that has a, a GPS point or at least a location where the area where that in, uh, specimen was identified. And so they keep track of that information and we can use that to kind of see what species have been um, recorded over hundreds of years, depending on how far back these museum records go. Um, and so not only do we use museum records, but we also used data from the verified naturalist databases. So iNaturalist and Odonata Central, um, which are really great resources and have also contributed a lot to the historical records. So based off of these historical records um, and using geospatial data, we're able to identify watersheds and habitats that are undersampled and contain species that may be declining or rare. So this is a map of the watersheds that the River Watch program uses. Um, and we plan on using this as well to help us select which sites um, to visit based off of what water watersheds have been underrepresented. So then once we do all of this um, initial steps, uh, we then will target specific areas of Illinois that have ponds and streams that haven't been sampled um, and so that we can then go and collect data from them. We will compile this information from the field and this information will then go to state and regional wildlife management plans. So my biggest focus of the Odonate project here at NGREC has been designing our sampling protocol, um, specifically for these targeted field assessments. Um, so in order to know what species are occupying stream and pond habitats, we need to have a standardized method for collecting from different locations and for different species. And so I'm kind of going to run through some of our methods um, that we use for that we'll, we, we will be using for this upcoming field season. Um, before collecting specimens, we have to make sure that the conditions are optimal for sampling. So not too windy, not too cold or cloudy. Odonates are very particular. They like to be active on dry and sunny days. Um, we will also be recording some really key environmental va variables that might influence the presence or absence of a species on any given day. And so whenever we get to a site, we take the air and water temperature, relativity, relative humidity, cloud cover, wind speed and uh, take in our surroundings to see if there's any specific dominant vegetation. Uh, we'll also be focusing on taking note of any invasive species that have been popping up as well. So our most important equipment that we use are our nets. Uh, so we need butterfly nets to catch adult odonates. However, you have to be a bit more aggressive when catching dragonflies than you do when you catch butterflies. And so we need many butterfly nets due to how often we break them. Um, but then we also use aquatic D-frame dip nets uh, with a very fine mesh to collect odonate nips in the water. And these nets are much sturdier due to them needing to be scraped along rocks, logs, and streams so that we can find the nymphs. So first I'm going to go over our aquatic sampling protocol. Um, so if you're a Riverwatch volunteer, um, it should sound somewhat familiar. Uh, but so we basically have two researchers that go out in the field at a time. Uh, where each of us will be sampling along a 50 meter transect to find dragonfly or damselfly nymphs. So for streams, our transect is essentially a straight line through the stream bed. Um, but in ponds, because it's really easy to get stuck in the muck, 
Um, we can't walk directly into the pond. Uh, we usually do somewhat of a circular transect along that shoreline of the pond. The point of these transects um, are to help ensure that we are sampling from the same amount of habitat at each site. It's the best way to standardize the protocol, and we're not oversampling a certain area or undersampling a certain area. And so within our 15 meter transect, we will spend time sampling from the best microhabitats within a stream or a pond. Uh, these microhabitats are areas where odonate nymphs really like to hide and burrow and will give us the best chance of finding them when we sample them. And so it's important to spend a, um, time at different microhabitats within our transect as different species will utilize different parts of a stream or a pond. So we don't just focus on one specific microhabitat. Um, so some of the best habitats for finding nymphs are riffles. Uh, riffles are the shallower, faster moving sections of a stream, um, and you can usually focus on them on the areas where the rocks will break the surface of flowing water. Uh, next, in both ponds and streams, uh, we look for leaf packs, particularly decaying leaf packs. The nymphs uh, will prefer to hide out in these leaf packs that have been in the water for a while. Uh, this really attracts uh, the prey that they like to eat as well. Uh, and lastly, uh, undercut banks and streams and banks of ponds are really important. Uh, a lot of roots from the surrounding vegetation can be found in this area and damselfly nymphs like to attach themselves to those um, along with fallen branches or snags that have been sitting in the water for a while. And so aquatic sampling involves a lot of kicking up sediment or scraping rocks and roots and basically forcing the nymphs to come out of their hiding spots uh, and into the net. The dip net is usually set up downstream, so any of the nymphs caught in a current will hopefully make it into the net. So when you dip netting, you pull up a lot of other things like sediment, mud, leaves, rocks, lots of other tiny insects or aquatic organisms that show up. Um, and it's part of uh, the, the protocol to sort through all of that as quickly as possible so that you can specifically find the dragonfly and damselfly nymphs that we're looking for. So dragonflies are relatively distinguishable due to their rather chunky state um, and they're easier to find, uh, but damselflies uh, are much more discreet. Uh, and can look similar to other macroinvertebrates such as mayfly nymphs. Um, but we can also find some cool, neat organisms just uh, while we're looking, such as crayfish or a water scorpion. So aerial sampling uh, is the next step. Um, although I wish it was, it's not quite the idyllic activity that you'd imagine with butterfly catching. Um, it is relatively the same process, but much more intense. Um, if you remember from when I spoke earlier, uh, you know that the zigzag pattern that adults use when escaping predators, well, they also use that on humans, um, and it's very effective. Uh, so not only are we chasing them uh, after these very fast species, uh, we're doing it in muck boots, but also wet rocks um, and in sticky muck. Uh, so it's rather challenging and we're still getting some practice and getting better at it soon. <laughs> but so basically following those same transects as aquatic um, sampling, we'll walk those areas again and we'll focus on the favorite perching locations of odonates. So these are usually sunny spots on a stick or a branch um, that happens to be sticking out of the water, but also they like to sit on vegetation. So we'll focus on those areas. However, not all of the species of adult dragonflies or damselflies like to perch. Some of them stay flying while they are active. So at the same time, we are also attempting to catch anything that's flying around or over our head, which takes a lot of special skill. So at the end of our collecting period, uh, we will be performing a visual survey of any of the adults on the wing within our same transect. Um, and the point of this is to kind of just get a triple check um, of anything that we were not able to catch um, or able to observe during the aerial sampling. And so this time will be dedicated to just whatever we can spot uh, within that transect area 
Um, we'll be using scopes and binoculars um, as well, just in case we need to get a better view um, in order to ID these adults in the field since we won't be able to bring them back to the lab. So once we're all done with that, we collect our voucher specimen specimens. And so once we've collected everything, we kind of go through them um, and we decide if we have any repeats of any of the adults, we let some, those repeats go. Um, and we kind of go through and count how many dragonfly or damselfly nymphs that we have just off of the off the bat and combine them into a jar. Um, and so for adults, we uh, it's really important for us to collect at least one voucher specimen um, at each site, but that's usually all we will do. We don't want to over collect from any particular population. Um, it's good to just have a representative uh, individual uh, that we can then use to verify a species presence. Um, and museums and um, other uh, insect collectors like to use this as well to verify the research. And so um, we try our best to not collect over collect too many of the nymphs, but it is a lot harder to identify nymphs in the field. Um, and so um, a microscope is usually needed. And so in the end, uh, we take back these specimens to our uh, NGRAC field station, where we can kind of take a closer look and ID them in the lab. So back in the lab, we try to break down um, the closest ID that we can using various resources. Uh, the most important resource for us is a dichotomous key, uh, which is a scientific method used to identify different organisms based on observable traits. Um, the ID process starts at the largest taxonomic unit. Um, so for us, it would be the suborder. So is it a dragonfly or is it a damselfly? And starting there, we move down um, and we'll move through families, genus, genus, and then to species. And so based on the preservation or the size of the specimen, we might not make it down all the way to species, but we do our best to try and get as close as possible so that we can make sure to represent the data that we collected. So a lot of the pictures or the specimens um, seen in this presentation were from our pilot season that we ran last summer and fall. For that pilot season, we focused on ponds and streams in Southern Illinois, uh, specifically in the Shawnee National Forest area. Um, and we used this time to kind of test out different methods and different way to preserve specimens, um, best way to label them um, so that we can kind of perfect these techniques for any upcoming issues as we're starting our first full field season in April. Um, and this field season will run from April to about October, which is the primary flight season for species in Illinois. Um, and so our other plan uh, is to move northward out of Southern Illinois as well, um, and planning to uh, focus on some of these areas that haven't been um, sampled enough that we identified during our historical record looking at and things like that. Most likely avoiding the Chicagoland area, but the Northwest corner, Central Illinois, a lot of information is missing from those areas and we hope to really fill those gaps. And so I know Hannah briefly mentioned about the River Watch program um, at NGRAC, uh, you know, which is led by Dr. Danielle Hake and Hannah Griffiths. Um, and so I know um, a lot of you might also be volunteers for that. Um, and it's a really great program. If you don't know what it is, um, they collect uh, habitat and biological data of the local streams throughout the state of Illinois. Um, but our goals is also to um, use some of the sites that Riverwatch has been monitoring for a long time. Um, and the goal is to kind of take a more in-depth look at these streams that have maybe been protected and monitored more so than just some other public streams um, that haven't been. And so our goal is to add um, a subset of River Watch streams. Um, and so if there are any River Watch volunteers listening in this evening, I just kind of wanted to put a plug in for anyone who might have a stream for us to sample from, specifically for Odinates. Um, or if you know of any public wetlands nearby your site um, that we could also sample, that information would be really greatly appreciated. 
Um, and if you have that, you could contact Danielle, Hannah, or me about that further. Um, but that would be really awesome. And then lastly, I just kind of wanted to briefly mention our goals for hosting an Odinate BioBlitz in Illinois through our uh, NGREC. Um, and so if you don't know what a BioBlitz is, it's an event where volunteers can go out to find, identify, or collect as many of the designated organisms as possible. And since Odinates can kind of be found in many different areas and in many different times of the year, it's impossible for us as researchers to find every species. Um, but by using volunteers of all ages to get outside and help find dragonflies and damselflies, we can increase our knowledge of these fascinating and important species. So if you're interested in this, stay tuned uh, and also live in Illinois. We are designing and planning this right now and hopefully to have this hope to have this running sometime in 2024 as we kind of get gather more information after this field season. So with that, I hope I have uh, convinced you that dragonflies and damselflies are super cool and amazing. Um, and I want to thank you for listening. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All right. Thank you, Amy. That was great. I definitely learned a lot, even though I've already been helping with this project. <laughs> um, so if anybody has any questions, you can either put them into the chat um, or you're welcome to ask it out loud. There are already a couple of things in the chat. Um, so firstly, uh, Patricia mentioned that there is a, a citizen science group in Southern Illinois that's doing dragonfly surveys, odinate surveys. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of that already, Amy. Awesome. Um, yeah. I've been looking at, um, I've seen some other information about that, but it'd be great to connect with them. Thank you for that. Um, and then um, what nymph identification keys slash resources are you using? Um, so we're using, uh, I don't know the actual name of it because it's such a giant book, but the macroinvertebrate, the guide to aquatic macroinvertebrate species, I believe is what it is, but the big giant, like multiple mini chapters. Um, there's a specific chapter on odonates. Um, so that's the dichotomous key that I'm using. And then also... There's a specific dragonfly nymph um, guide by Kenneth Tennyson, I believe his name is, um, that has also been very helpful in getting a little bit more specifics and bringing things down to a species level. Um, Joyce, if you want anything more specific, you're welcome to email any of us and we can give you those resources. Um, okay, and then somebody mentioned um, the wetlands around Alton and West Alton. Um, which that's where we are based. <laughs> um, so we are familiar with that area, but I appreciate the input. Oh, there you go. I wasn't very much help, was I? That's okay. <laughs> no, that's great. We plan on hitting yeah. some of these areas uh, this upcoming season because um, they're right by our, our work. So that'd be great. Do you, do you use that little bitty baby one down there that charge them EV uh, cars? It's like a little building to the left, and then there's the big wetland riverland where you can see the eagles on the right. And then if you cross the bridge, uh, there's some back in there, and they're making changes uh, by the first gas station back there in the natural wetlands. So just some, you know, a little info. Yeah. yeah. No, that'd be great and easy to do. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, Mac asked if you are connected to Peggy, and I'm probably going to butcher the last name, uh, Note Bart, um, from the, uh, museum in Chicago, um, they also do dragonfly monitoring. Uh, we have not been connected with them as we're focusing specifically on, like, non-Chicagoland areas, but, um, love to get in contact with them and, get more resources if possible, but thanks. So thanks for that. Um, and then a couple people said that they joined late. There will be a link um, to the talk. It will be out on our YouTube channel uh, probably within two weeks, it'll be up. Um, are there any native plants that Odinates host on or that will attract them to our landscape? 
Um, so it's actually, you know, anything that attracts uh, native insects or pollinators will attract dragonflies because the dragonflies will and damselflies will be eating anything that will pollinate um, the local native plants. And so basically just focusing on, on those native plants that attract local pollinator, pollinators, um, having a water source nearby as well is really helpful as when they emerge uh, right away, they have some food supplies. Um, so nothing in particular as they don't utilize plants or vegetation, um, but they'll focus on the species that do. Um, and then other than the Heinz emerald dragonfly, do you know of any other endangered dragonflies or damselflies, um, either federal or state endangered? So that's actually one of the biggest goals for us is because we only have those two um, listed right now and everything else isn't listed, any, nothing else is listed because there's not enough data to decide that information. And so that's our biggest goal right now is just getting a baseline data so that we can then help inform those decisions the next time we go to make a state wildlife plan so we can kind of work better to protect these areas that these uh, ordinates use. What's, what's the second one that's endangered? Uh, there's the Heinz Emerald and the Elfin Skimmer. Okay. Um, and then you mentioned this in the talk, but um, are fish also prey for them? Um, for prey, yeah. So fish can be actually predators and prey. Um, so, um, and it's pretty interesting. There's a lot of research done on um, odonate nymphs that live in either fish or fishless ponds and kind of what species usually usually utilize those areas. And um, and so, yes, uh, fish, like more like minnows are usually the prey, but bigger fish can be predators as well. Um, how do you account for species that hatch and then die off in one single big batch when you're sampling? Um, so the goal is to go out more often <laughs> um, to catch those. They don't be, so there's mayfly species that will like live for a day and then die. Um, but for dragonflies, they usually live to up to a month. And so we're trying to visit these wetlands um, multiple times, um, hopefully three times uh, per season. Uh, so that way we can kind of get a better snapshot. Um, but that's why we're also collecting aquatic and aerial samples. So even if a, um, a, a dragonfly adult may only be around in say June and we don't happen to visit there um, in June, they may still have nymphs uh, that we can identify in the ponds or the streams when we go back in July. Um, and so there's kind of a double way to get gather information. Um, it's either we can get them as nymphs or we can get them as adults, which is really handy. Um, okay. Um, what can we do to help support dragonflies and damselflies at home? Um, yeah, just kind of reiterating that planting uh, native plants around will bring predator or bring their prey that they like. Um, having a water source is important. Um, I know it does bring mosquito larvae, but dragonflies and damselflies love mosquito larvae. Um, so that's kind of it. Uh, reducing lights. Uh, as well, um, that can kind of really mess up their flight patterns and things like that. Okay, and then they mentioned that they do have like a woodland stream bed, but it's dry much of the year. Can you talk about, like you mentioned ephemeral um, wetlands and streams. Can you um, talk about those a little bit more? Yeah, so those are going to be like specialist species that will lay their eggs in those ephemeral streams that dry up really fast. And so um, I can't think of an example right now, but there are a lot of species uh, that will drop their eggs uh, and they usually are be able, able to have larval development in a couple weeks and then they'll um, become adults and able to go find a new wetland habitat before that dries up. Of course, with the changing uh, with climate change and things like that, some of these ephemeral streams and wetlands are drying up quicker than they're used to. And so that is can cause a big die off of a population. Um, and so we can kind of hopefully the goal is to see how they're adapting to these changes in, in weather patterns. Um, but that's a really great um, observation. Um, and then a couple of people were talking about how um, the Illinois Odonate Survey is run by that Peggy Notebart Nature Museum. Um, and they're having a field experience in the end of April. 
Um, so there's that. <laughs> um, if you guys, if anybody else here is in the Chicago area and is interested in that. Um, um, some more okay. wetlands suggestions. Was somebody talking? Yeah, yeah, this is uh, Pat Dunbar. Yeah. I'm a, a co coordinator for the Southern, Southern Illinois, Illinois Ordinate Survey Group. Mm -hmm. uh, this um, field experience that we have on here is part of our training. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's also for re education and looking for new monitors. This will be in Southern Illinois. Okay, and, sorry. Yep. Okay. And if people are interested, um, I would hate to give out my address and be you know, mistaken uh, with some of the areas that we are choosing, they probably could contact Peggy Notabart, which uh, and Dr. Tyrone, who will be here and will tour with us for two days. Uh, but it's a, it's a fabulous experience. Uh, our uh, Illinois Ordinate Survey here is probably four years, so we are fairly new. But we have many really good sites and a lot of promising data that we are um, putting together. So if Amy, if you have interest in contacting us and working with us, uh, talk to Dr. Turan and he will make arrangements. That's probably awesome. the best. Thank you so much. Um, so there's lots of uh, wetland recommendations in the chat, so I'll just have to save that. Okay. <laughs> and, send it to you. Um, uh, and how long have you been collecting dragonfly data? Uh, so the specific grant that we're working for for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources um, uh, started about a year or two ago. Um, and so I specifically have only been collecting for the last six months um, since that's when I started this position um, and have been spearheading the collecting since then. And so um, that's why we just had a kind of trial pilot period um, at the end of the summer slash fall just to kind of get an idea of how things are going to work. Um, as dragonflies and damselflies are, are newer to me, so I had to learn how to how to sample for them. Mm -hmm. um, and then, can you address climate change effects in dragonflies? Um, for example, hybridization of species or nymph maturation changes or a change in timing? Yeah. Um, so I actually don't know how often dragonflies and damselflies hybridize, but that is something I would love to look into. Um, I think they are why they have such specific coloration. Um, there are a couple species that look very similar, or not a couple, but there's a decent amount of group species within families that look very similar. Um, but for the most part, uh, I would assume that those families in particular might have some hybridization, but are probably very closely related anyways, so things aren't too different. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, the temperature changes, yeah, this will greatly affect uh, how larvae will develop. Um, if they're not able to develop quick enough, you know, things might dry out before they're ready. Temperatures might get too warm. Um, dragonflies and damselflies do love warmth, um, so they might do well for, for a little bit, but once things get too extreme, it might not happen. Um, one of the other issues that I've been noticing um, is, you know, we have these warmer temperatures, but then all of a sudden we'll have a cold snap. And some of these species will get adapted to these warmer temperatures and get ready to molt or things like that, and then have a cold snap and die really fast. Um, and so adults don't do super well in really cold weather. Um, and if they're not able to disperse or migrate quick enough, uh, you could see a lot of probably um, detrimental effects. Um, and then do you know anything about um, any, how sensitive odonates are to insecticides, um, specifically ones to control mosquitoes? Uh, I do think they're very sensitive um, to any type of insecticide. Um, so any, they have the same similar, you know, exoskeleton and um, things like that, when, especially when they're adults even, um, they function just like most insects. So if an insecticide is being used, it, they are insects, so they most likely will also suffer. Um, and where will your collective specimens be deposited at the end of the study? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so our goal, uh, most of them will go to the Illinois Natural History Survey. 
um, they'll be used as like a quality control, but then we'll also be donating them to um, their kind of the U of I um, museum collection that they have there. Um, and then uh, we hope to uh, create a little bit of a um, insect pinning board or some of the nymphs to save at NGREC that our education department can use for um, any teaching tools that they may want. Okay, I'm just kind of skipping to some of the questions in the chat. Um, and I'll make sure that Amy, if you're not already looking at the chat, I'll make sure that Amy gets copy of the chat so she can see everything that you guys are saying. Thank you. <laughs> um, do you have protocols in place for surveying for species that may not be active on sunny days? For example, the fawn darner. <laughs> um, again, so that's why we sample aquatic and adults. Uh, so even if it's, uh, you know, sunny days might be best for most of the species. Um, and I know for a fact that we've actually found a lot of fawn dar dar darners, um, nymphs. Uh, so we're able to get both sides of that spectrum. Um, and that's that's why we're doing both adult and uh, aquatic um, sampling. Um, if there are no more questions, if you guys come up with anything um, or want to follow up with any of us, um, you can, if you didn't write down Amy's email when she had it up, um, if you reply to the message um, that you should have got, um, about the uh, webinar tonight, you should get my email address, um, or you can find us on the NGREC website. Um, and then I just have a couple of announcements. Um, our next speaker series is going to be um, Thursday, February 23rd, and it's going to be Ashley Kleinder from Joliet Junior College, and she'll be presenting on her research um, that she did on how log jams and snags affect macroinvertebrates. And then also next week, we will be announcing our workshops, dates, and locations. Um, so if you're not already a River Watch volunteer, you can become one and learn how to catch your own dragonfly nymphs. <laughs> um, or if you already are one, you're welcome to attend the training workshops as well to get a refresher. Um, and so both of those things will be on our website, on the events page, and also on our Facebook page. And thanks again, Amy, for the presentation, and thank you to everybody who came out tonight. Thanks so much, Hannah.